So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I'm the interim director of, uh, of NITEX. Yeah. This afternoon, uh, we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Kim Martin uh, with us. Kim is a postdoc uh, at Stellenbosch University. She's a Hans Merensky uh, postdoctoral fellow at Stellenbosch University and also <clears throat> an international fellow of the Software Sustainability uh, Institute. Yeah? Um, her uh, research, I think, is in tissue engineering. Uh, and I will, won't go into that now, <clears throat> but uh, but she the reason why she's talking to us today is because she's an, uh, a proponent of the role of research software uh, engineer, engineering of in in our academic software development eco uh, ecosystem. Yeah, and she's trying very hard to set up uh, uh, a community of uh, RSEs enthusiasts uh, uh, in Stellenbosch and uh, and across the the, the country. Yeah. So, uh, Kim, we are very happy that um, that you offered uh, to to share with you your expertise in this topic that should be of interest to at least to all the computational guys in NITEX. Yeah. So, thank you very much for being with us uh, this afternoon, and um, you're most and welcome to start uh, sharing your screen. And uh, and while you do so, I just remind the the, the, the participants to please use the Q and A facility to ask questions <clears throat> and, and maybe after the talk you're welcome to raise your hand and we can give you the right to uh, to speak and as we started last week um, we, we, we are trying to not to record the question session after the talk so that people don't feel that they, they, they don't have to be scared that their questions uh, are on YouTube forever. <laughs> yeah, so we're trying this experiment to see if that induces people to ask more questions and engage more with the, uh, with the speaker. Yeah, so Kim, thank you very much. We can see your, the, 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 your first slide uh, clearly. You're most and welcome to start with your talk. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Francesco. And I'm hoping that this is of interest to um, anyone who attends, not just uh, specifically computational people. Um, so if Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my talk is on research software engineering as a component of a healthy academic ecosystem. So first to define what an RSE is. So the, the definition or the, the, the term was first coined um, in 2012 by the UK based Software Sustainability Institute um, on the recognition that research is increasingly dependent on software and such software requires people who combine professional software expertise with an understanding of research. Now I just want to um, emphasize that RSEs are academics. They are distinguished from traditional software engineers by having a research background. They work to advance research by collaborating with other domain experts. Uh, and there is now proof that there is potential of tenure in such a role. So uh, Sheffield University has recently appointed a professor of research software engineering. Um, as for the roles of RSEs in the academic ecosystem, um, there there are advantages to for all researchers, regardless of what field they're in, um, of working with an RSE. So the potential to do research better and faster, um, to have more success at winning grants and larger grants. Uh, funders are becoming increasingly aware of the advantages that RSEs bring to um, research in terms of quality and, and um, reusability of research. Um, so more fame in that uh, you're more likely to get citations of usable code. So if you've written code yourself, but um, potentially it's not uh, that accessible to someone other than yourself, um, having a, an RSE work with you to make sure that it is um, more accessible uh, makes it more likely that you're going to get credit for it in the future. And also there's less risk for notoriety. So maybe less risk of retractions due to errors in the research code. And there are some um, examples of that. Um, this badge here, better software, better research, is the motto of the Software Sustainability Institute. I've got a nice sticker on my laptop that says exactly the same thing. Um, there is this trend now towards open science. Um, and as I say, that the funders are definitely moving in this direction as well. So the Science Code Manifesto is one manifestation of this. Um, and just to highlight um, two of the principles that it raised um, and has been endorsed by many researchers, including by those of the SSI. Um, there is a, an argument that all source code that's been written um, for a published paper must be available to the reviewers and to the readers of the paper. So that's now um, making the code open. 
Um, and then also citation and credit, where those who were involved in the research should get credit by those who maybe go on to use that code later on. Um, and if I want to talk a little bit more about the history of the RSE, you know, coming back to the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, so the Software and Sustainability Institute argues that good software practices create better software, resulting in improved reproducibility and reusability of research. And their mandate uh, includes points such as all researchers should have access to basic software training. Um, software should be accepted as a valid research output included in metrics. Um, so when a, um, someone is, is advancing in their career, software that they've written should be weighed the same as papers are weighed. Uh, and there should be reward and recognition for the people who develop and maintain research software and the means to fund their involvement uh, in research. Um, so just to, to highlight the insights of the SSI, modern research de depends on software and reproducible, reusable software depends on skilled people. Um, so why was it so important that the SSI coined this term RSE? Um, Around about 2012, shortly after, they, they did a, a study where they looked at academic job adverts, where there'd been some relationship to software development in the, in the role. And they discovered that there were almost 200 different job titles uh, associated with those roles. Um, and then the argument was or is that if there is no name for a position, there's no name for a role, then there is no career path associated with that. If there's no career path, then there's no job security. And if there is no job security, there's no future in academia for those people. And thus there is no sustainable supply of expertise. So the sort of typical archetype um, would often be the case is a PI is maybe re requiring some, someone to focus on writing software to advance their research. Uh, they'll often uh, bring in a, a postdoc to, to do the work. Um, so now you have a postdoc who is busy writing software. They've probably not been formally trained in software engineering. So they're, they've got maybe some fairly ad hoc practices. Uh, they tend to work in isolation. They don't belong to a community of practice. Uh, they're working in a, in a group where they're trying to learn things as they go by themselves. Um, so on the on the science side, they are you, you have someone who is not an expert developing code, and it's unlikely that that code is going to be very maintainable in the future when that postdoc inevitably leaves. Uh, and then on the, on the human side, on the HR side, you've got a, a person who is brought into a role where they will be uh, judged on the number of papers that they publish, but they're explicitly being asked not to write papers, but to write codes. So the likelihood is that they're not going to end, end their postdoc in a position where their academic career has been advanced. Uh, and the likelihood is that they will uh, maybe bounce around uh, for a while more, but many of these people leave academia eventually, and then whatever expertise has been developed uh, during this period um, gets taken away. Um, but things have been changing over the last 10 years, uh, thanks in, in good measure to the efforts of the SSI and other organizations like it. Um, there's now an international community. So there are international RSC associations in many countries uh, and regions. Um, there is also the beginnings of a community in South Africa or in Africa called um, Research Software and Systems Engineers. They've added that little extra um, piece. Um, but this community is in the early stages of developing now. Um, there is also a, a Slack, uh, active Slack workspace for um, RSCs across internationally. You don't have to be a member. So it's being hosted by the Society of Research Software Engineering. Uh, but you don't have to become a member of the society to join this, this Slack. Um, and there are conferences. So um, the sixth conference is going to be held in September of this year in the UK. Um, and hopefully I will be attending, but we'll see. Um, there are multiple models for RSE skills provision. So I made some of the arguments of, of why um, academics researchers benefit from having RSEs available to them. Um, the different models include embedded RSEs. So that would be an RSE who's um, formally placed within a research group, um, different from the postdoc story I mentioned earlier, because this would be someone who actually has recognition for this role. And that's the advantage of being able to develop themselves um, and potentially progress as into more senior roles later on. There's also been um, RSE fellowships, so um, produced, um, provided, for example, by the, um, the UK-based um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And then there is this, um, this construct called an RSE group, which started um, arising at about the same time as the SSI coined the term in 2012. Um, 
So the first RSC groups were formed at leading UK universities beginning in 2012, and there's almost 30 um, groups in the UK now. Um, I think the first one was at the University College London, um, but there's now groups in places like Finland, which is there's a group that I'm particularly interested in, and, um, and other places, other countries. Um, so some of the benefits of RSC groups. Now, I took this information straight from a talk by Paul Richmond, who's the RSC leader, group leader of the Sheffield um, RSC group. Um, but he puts it very well. So the benefits are, are multifold. So for the RSCs themselves, they have stable careers. They have a peer group and they have recognition and development. Um, for research projects that those RSCs participate in, um, there is flexible access to expertise as and when is needed. So sharing between projects. So the the it's not that um, uh, a PI might need to now hire an RSE to do their work um, for however long. They can actually just tap into the expertise as and when they need it. Uh, and there's also access to niche skills. So rather than relying on one person who now has to do everything, um, RSE groups tend to um, evolve in a direction that that where you have more and more specialized people who can do different things. Uh, and then for individual researchers, there is a source of help and advice, um, often training is being provided, and also whatever infrastructure that the RSC group might provide. So, for example, an institutional GitHub repository might be run by the RSC group. Um, so to talk about one RSC group as an example, I'm coming back to the Sheffield group. Um, so they were started in 2015 with a single member of staff. Uh, they started out with grassroots initiatives, so you know, running training programs, doing some consulting, running some demonstration projects. Um, then two of these EPSRC RC fellowships were awarded, um, and then they were followed by additional grants, which was leveraging now the increasing interest that funders are signed to, have been signed to show in, in RSC and having RSCs involved in research. Um, then they started getting more support from senior university leadership, and also increasingly interest from academics in their university who realized that they had the advantage of having help to do their research better and also they could win larger grants with the assistance of RSEs. So um, RSE groups have different models for sustainability. Um, in the case of the Sheffield group, the RSC salaries are underwritten jointly by the Department of um, Computer Science and also by IT services. And those costs are recovered through project grants. Now, there's a lot of complexity that's to this that I, I can't promise to understand, I can't, can't pretend to understand right now, but I've, I've spoken to a number of the group leaders behind this, and there are different models involved, but it seems that this is a very successful um, practice. Um, so I, the, the UCL group, for example, tends to bring in, they are also underwritten, but they bring in a lot more uh, in grants and, and overheads than they, than they actually receive in underwriting. And I think the same is the case for um, Sheffield and other groups like it. Um, this, what the group, in this case, again, the University of Sheffield offers is they um, collaborate with researchers on projects and they tend to target, they tend to work on projects where they have been involved from the grant writing stage. So that is part of their, um, their strategy is to um, get involved before the, the funding has actually been awarded. Um, so they can be written into the grants themselves uh, and they can uh, make sure that, that, that some of that funding is now available to support them and that they are also uh, working collaboratively with the researcher from, a, from an early stage. Um, they also do uh, work with people who have already been awarded um, projects. Um, they, one of the things that they work on is providing training and mentoring, um, allowing people to develop uh, with the support of RSC. So one of the, the, the recommendations is that if a postdoc, for example, is starting in a new project that's very computationally uh, intensive, it would be useful to pair them up with an ex um, um, experienced RSE for a month or so, just to make sure that they get started um, with a firm base of good practices when it comes to the computational work. Um, and then they also provide, um, the RC group also provides a sort of hub for um, community type uh, events. Um, this has been a very successful model. Um, as I say, the University of Sheffield group is an example of this or exemplar of this. So the group leader has now been made a professor of research software engineering. Um, the group has been steadily growing and consists of 13 permanent staff members and several secondments as of recently. Uh, and I've been told that the group is kept so busy with projects that it's actually hard to make time to meet this demand for training. And there is demand for training. Um, 
talking now about local context, uh, so in South Africa and then more specifically in Stellenbosch University where I'm based. Um, so coming back to my personal story, I'm uh, my, my training is in biomedical science. Um, it's only been a uh, sort of during the latter stages of my PhD that I discovered that I really enjoyed coding much more than I enjoyed web bench work. And I've been moving progressively more in that direction. Um, I attended a, an R conference in the middle of last year. Uh, and I um, listened to this talk by um, Heidi Seibold, um, her keynote when she talked about what a research software engineer was. Uh, and I'd never heard the term before. And it was a bit of an epiphany moment for me because it made complete sense the role of an RSC in terms of the bigger academic ecosystem. And it also made sense for me as in this has seemed to be something that a direction that I wanted to go in with my own um, career. So when I looked at the, 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 the roles, what an RSC does that she was talking about, um, I was already fulfilling many of these um, roles within the group that I was based in. And these were things that I really enjoyed doing, um, including teaching students and, and assisting them with writing code and things like that. Um, and I could see myself doing that more. And I also really, really wanted to become better. I wanted to become a professional RSC. Um, so to that end, uh, I had this the sense of, well, I need to belong. I need to find myself a community of practice that I can belong to, that I can, uh, people I can connect to, uh, connect with, um, where I can, uh, you know, people I can learn from, maybe I can even collaborate with people. Um, and I started looking around and I did find the RSSE Africa um, community, but at the time it was especially quiet. The, I mean, I think it had been it had been started during the sort of you know, COVID time, and I think that it put a bit of a dampener on planned events and things. But um, and but even so, I, I actually wanted a local community. I wanted people within Stellenbosch University that I could talk to. Um, but when I started um, reaching out and trying to find what was who was out there um, I was finding that that no one else seemed to be aware of what our um, RSE was um, there didn't seem to be a community that I could immediately join um, so I started sort of pitching to um, to try to start a group um, I was thinking at that time a a community just a sort of club almost um, and I was making this argument you know reproducible research requires people who have expertise in research and software development and there is no local community um, at Stellenbosch University at the moment. There are people who fill these roles, but they are operating in silos. They're isolated in different service units and research groups like myself. Um, and there, there's this loss, this opportunity cost of the, the opportunities for cross-disciplinary learning and collaboration are not being realized. And as would be the case if people could maybe naturally bridge these, these different faculties and start talking about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, I was also talking to people about um, the problems that they were seeing. So I, I started hearing people talking about um, the, the fears around reputational risk in case errors creep into public published code. Um, and, you know, the sort of interest in, you know, if there was some way of getting some kind of code review before things get published, this would be um, a good idea. Um, also things like, you know, tr struggles with poor quality code written by people who obviously don't have a software engineering background, but who are, um, you know, scientific coders, um, which was difficult to understand or maintain, uh, which limits the potential for re reuse and tends to lead to people reinventing the wheel. And then also just generally, um, people, who, researchers lacking coding skills at all, um, or, you know, substantially lacking skills, which limits their ability to generate or manage or utilize their data. And again, is a massive um, opportunity cost because it limits the scope of the research they can do and the potential impact they can have. Um, so I was seeing, I was seeing these signs of, um, of, of you know, supply in and demand, um, supply in that there are skilled people dotted throughout the university, and demand in that their researchers know that there's a problem. But it was a, a case of you know, well, what what to work on? You know, supply demand. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? How do researchers know that they need RSEs if they don't know what an RSE is? And if researchers don't know that they need RSEs, how is it possible to start something? Um, at this point, I started thinking about something a bit more formal. Um, I'd been, it had been suggested that, that something more formal was required because the services was actually required. Um, but how to establish an RSE group under such conditions of limited resources where actually even the knowledge that, you, that the services required is not there. Um, and, uh, you know, the way to, to try and start something under constrained conditions is to leverage whatever you can. Um, so I uh, applied for um, a Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship. Um, 
I was awarded one of the first three um, that uh, one of the first three international fellowships in the 10 year history of this fellowship. Um, so the, so uh, pr and previously, the last 10 years, the SSI has only awarded them within the UK. Um, and I was awarded some funding for a proposal that was aimed at raising the profile of RSC in South Africa. Um, and I decided to use this and um, other resources that I've been um, finding, uh, tapping into as uh, the way to try to kick off an RSC group at Stellenbosch University, um, which would be then the first RSC group in, in Africa, it seems, because it, 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 it's, this is not yet a model that has um, that has reached Africa, although um, although there is interest in RSC as the RSSE Africa community um, uh, nucleus has indicates. Um, so as for RSC at Sun, similarly to the, the Sheffield example and most RSC groups that I've looked at, uh, four main pillars of activity. So uh, training researchers, consulting, um, providing coding support, and I would think community building is, is an important, but potentially sort of um, something that would arise from the, the first three. Um, as far as training researchers and coding, um, this is where leveraging the Carpentries uh, makes a lot of sense. So for those who are not aware of the Carpentries, it's a nonprofit organization that focuses on teaching uh, foundational coding and data skills uh, to researchers, data science skills to, to researchers worldwide. Um, it's um, based, it, it, it's um, built mainly of volunteers, a community of volunteers who both develop the lessons and also then teach the material uh, in workshops to um, researchers. Uh, aimed at helping them conduct efficient, open, reproducible research. So, for example, um, so the, the, the material is um, in three different streams. There's one focused on software, one focused on data, one focused on, on library-related skills, useful skills. Um, typical skills on the software side might be teaching the Unix shell uh, for cloud computing and HPC, Git for version control, and either R or Python. There's le lessons available for both. Um, so lessons are collabor collaboratively developed to high standards and they're made openly available to anyone who wants to use them. But if you want to teach a Carpentries branded workshop, there needs to be at least one Carpentries certified instructor uh, involved in, the, in, in running that workshop. And then it doesn't cost anything, it doesn't cost anything to use the materials. Um, and I got certified as an instructor in 2021. Um, so then I was thinking, well, it makes sense for me to be able to use the Carpentries materials and run workshops as a service provision in this case. Um, so the first workshop I'll be running will be at the end of this month, um, and it's in um, collaboration with the Agroinformatics Initiative in Stellenbosch University. So the Agroinformatics Initiative is actually part funding me to do to establish RSC at Sun, um, because uh, Jan Freling, who runs the initiative, um, sees uh, synergies with with his focus on data uh, and good data practices in agro sciences. Um, on the uh, consulting side of things, um, I'm again leveraging, in this case, I'm leveraging my SSI fellowship. Um, so I've put forward a proposal uh, and it's, it was accepted and I've been awarded the funding. Um, the project is now in the sort of um, initial stages of advertising for participants. Um, my aim is to provide for about 10 Stellenbosch University researchers uh, to provide them with targeted consulting from UK based RSEs. Um, so now I'm leveraging the, the expertise that is available in the, U, in the UK, uh, in, the, in the RSE community there, and I'm leveraging the funding that's available to me through my, my fellowship. And the idea is that um, Stellenbosch University researchers will be provided with RSE related components that they can use to improve their existing grant proposals. So they would be building um, RSE into their grants uh, and grant applications to increase the scope and thus increase the impact. Um, so this is actually the, the flyer uh, that I've just been sending out now. Um, so I'm saying, you know, modern academic research requires the use of increasingly sophisticated computational approaches. Um, you know, funders are increasingly demanding this. There's a trend for open science. You know, there's a demand for code to be open to public scrutiny and RSEs can help with this. Um, and then the, the actual offer is uh, where the, there will be, um, the, an RSE in the UK will be matched with a Stellenbosch researcher. Um, they'll be given two hours of brainstorming with their RSE, um, and the, the RSE will then try to produce a text component to go into their grant application. Um, that's going to sort of 
provide, as I say, the scope and also the um, detail, the skills that would be involved. So it's not that this that the UK RSC would then be involved in, um, you know, carrying out the work of the uh, in the grant if the if the grant got awarded. Um, this the researcher could then, if they were awarded the funding, could then choose to collaborate or hire uh, uh, an RSE, picking them based on the skills that they've been um, told they're going to require to carry out that work. Um, and then on the side of coding support and engagements, um, so there is myself, but I would con wouldn't consider myself particularly experienced RSE, far from it. Um, but I'm not alone. I benefit from um, association with, among other people, um, there's Dr. John Cockroft, who is, he is an RSE, he just didn't realize he was until I, I informed him that he was, but he has been doing RSC work, uh, supporting researchers and also managing people who have been acting more as junior RSCs under him um, for some years now. Um, I've been speaking to um, the uh, IT service in the Selmosh University, and there's a lot of interest in collaborating with with them together and with in the future, which is very good. And I've also been um, looking at an affiliated member model where I have um, academics throughout the university from a, a range of different faculties, you see um, engineering, medicine, science, arts and social sciences, um, where these academics are interested in either themselves or with um, via students under their supervision. Um, participating in RSC projects. Um, so the idea would be that uh, a researcher comes to the RSC group and they've got an interesting project that they want um, need help with. Um, potentially an affiliated member or an affiliated member student would want to um, be partnered with them to do that work. Um, and the RSC group would be involved in the level of um, overseeing things and making sure that best practices were being followed. And uh, the complexities of this are yet to be worked out. There's several different models that may actually work um, in, in, at the same time, you know, in, in different cases. Um, but it, this is looking uh, very, uh, very promising and something that I'm actually very excited about in terms of um, a very natural way of, again, bridging between silos and, and promoting cross-disciplinary collaboration within Stonewash University. Um, yeah, and just further on the on the IT collaboration side. So um, the IT um, service in Stellenbosch University has actually already added me and put me on the backside, the, the, the sort of um, back end of the um, research ICT service desk, and they've added uh, a, a sort of section for research software engineering. I haven't been advertising um, this yet because I'm trying to gradually build up what um, the, the sort of um, service and I, I'm concerned about being overwhelmed but uh, the fact that this is there is I think quite a nice um, indication of of, uh, of willingness to work together um, and then finally on the community building side this is maybe where I put a little bit less thought but I've um, had um, talks with the director of the school for data science and computational thinking um, and he has offered to put some funds towards running some RSC um, events. Um, and that'll probably hopefully happen towards the end of this year. I've already got at least one lined up um, towards you know, maybe October or afterwards. Um, plans for um, 2022 is to engage with the research community about their needs, um, to pilot these core services to demonstrate value. So uh, the training and the consulting and the coding and maybe community development or community nurturing. Um, and then also to evolve the model to best serve Stellenbosch University as a whole. Uh, and this has now been a very lean, agile, um, pick your jargon term um, approach. And I think that's actually a very good thing um, because it gives me, it, 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 it's a very um, lightweight way of piloting a service. Um, and rather than having to make a big bet upfront with you know, big grant funding, to decide which direction it's going to go and what it's going to look like, there is the opportunity to explore um, in a fairly um, flexible way. Uh, but the intention is to get to the end of this year with a better plan, a better picture of what's actually needed and what would work in this context, uh, and then to start applying for more funding and figuring out a sustainability model. Potentially, um, I'm, I'm quite sort of um, fond of the model that the, uh, the Sheffield RSE group uses where they have where there are permanent full um, uh, permanent staff RSCs within the RSC group 
um, but uh, instead of not, they're not in a position where their salaries are hand to mouth grant funded all the time. They're actually underwritten by some part um, of the university, and then that uh, underwriting uh, gets repaid or recovered in in grants and and, and things like that. Um, and just I wanted to um, add in here. So although it was my intention partly to keep things as simple as possible, this um, Software Sustainability Institute funded RSE consulting pilot project. Um, it has just started, I've just started advertising now uh, on I'm recruiting RSDs on the UK side and, and um, researchers on the Stellenbosch University side. Um, although technically I'm planning on limiting it to Stellenbosch University people for simplicity, I am actually open to researchers from other universities in South Africa um, getting involved if they're interested. Um, it may be possible, I mean, my, my budget li is limiting me to 10 um, consulting engagements so far, but I'm, I've also had a lot of interest from the RSE community already. Um, there's been people talking about volunteering, so then funding is not a limit. And there's also people talking about um, additional sources of funding I should apply for to extend this project, um, in which case I may be able to help more people. Um, so if you're a researcher who is not in Stellenbosch University, but you'd be interested in receiving some free consulting from an RSE in the UK, please um, get in touch and I will, um, I'd like to be able to help. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for your time. Uh, that's my email address. Um, that's, that uh, is the um, current website of RSE at Sun, uh, which um, talks a little bit more about um, the services that are being offered. Um, that's the link to the RSSC Africa community page, um, which I recommend you join if you're interested in becoming an RSE. Um, and also, if you are interested in becoming an RSE, I would hi uh, highly recommend you join the International RSE Slack, um, which is available, open to um, anyone. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Kim, for a very nice, uh, interesting and, and, and practical uh, uh, presentation. Um...